Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased uh, to welcome Garen Cycle in support of RX and joined by uh, the poet at Roberson this evening. Uh, just a quick webinar overview for our attendees. The chat is closed, but you can keep the chat window open as I'll be uh, uh, sharing links, excuse me, to purchase books by tonight's readers from Literati throughout the event. The Q&A is accessible to you as well. That's on your toolbar. Uh, please feel free to submit questions at any time. I will read a selection uh, of your questions at the conclusion of the readings this evening. And live transcription is available to you on your toolbar as well, should you need that. That's provided by Zoom's automated transcription. And if you're watching this later on YouTube, there are always links to purchase books from Literati in the description directly below me. You can be sure to subscribe to our channel as well, and you'll be kept up to date with all of our At Home with Literati events once they become available on our channel. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, though, we'd just like to thank you for your attendance this evening uh, or this morning or this afternoon, uh, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us from. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's readers uh, in the order that they will be reading this evening. Karen Seichel grew up in Southeastern Illinois and has lived in Miami, Southern Minnesota, and Chicago. Where he's lived for the past two decades. A series of Illinois poems, including Blue Mound to 161, Hostile Witness, The Bone Gatherer, and the forthcoming Prairie, explore violence, displacement, and changing ecologies across the state and throughout the 20th century. His work also includes the screenplays, The Indianan and The Hippodrome, an adaptation of Silas Coulter's novel. Rx is Cycle's first novel. And Ed Roberson's 11 previous books of poetry include Just In, Word of Navigational Challenges, City, Glogue, The New Wing of the Labyrinth, MPH, and Other Road Poems, and the Los Angeles Times Book Award finalist and Kingsley Tufts Award runner-up to see the earth before the end of the world. A former special programs administrator at Rutgers University's Cook Campus, Roberson has lived in Chicago since 2004 and is an emeritus professor in Northwestern University's MFA Creative Writing Program. He's also held posts at the University of Chicago, Columbia College, University of California, Berkeley, and the Cave Canem Retreat for Black Writers. His honors include the Jackson Poetry Prize, the Shelley Memorial Award, the Ruth Ridley Poetry Prize, the Leela Wallace Reader's Digest Writers Award, and the African American Literature and Cultural Association's Stephen Anderson Critics Award. Please join me in welcoming Karen Seichel and Ed Roberson into your living rooms. Thanks so much, John. And it's, it's an honor to read with you tonight, Ed. Um, so I, I just want to read a few passages from the, from the novel, uh, Rex. And um, I mean, the, the novel itself kind of comes out of a joke that my dad and I always had that uh, he was a physician in uh, Southern Illinois and um, a GP down there. And, and I, I always like threatened him that uh, after he died, I was going to assume his identity and, and uh, practice medicine without a license. So the whole book Kind of comes out of that it's a character who um does that very thing and uh and as uh as he does the the, the country is kind of in a uh, uh in a moment of 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 disintegration um the uh i wanted to read a couple passages one the first is uh where he he hires his nurse um and so this uh this is in a chapter called connecticut a woman walked in with today's newspaper under her arm. They too had wanted a photo. I'd given them a baseball cap selfie taken under the office's shady overhang in the late afternoon. She held the assumption welcomes new physician headline under my nose. She waved the picture in my face. I'm Maura Walker. I'm your new nurse, she said. You are? Where and when did you last work? I asked. I was Doc Williams' nurse until about two years ago. Was? He fired me. She tucked the paper under her arm. Let's talk about this, I said. Okay, she said and opened a metal folding chair and sat down. I got nothing to hide anymore. Maura launched into a description of her pill habit, the proximate hesitations and slow theft of pills, baggies of uppers and bennies, the two solid years of hiding it before she'd taken to filching painkillers from the large red craftsman toolbox on wheels that Williams kept anchored as a medicine chest in one of the exam rooms. 
I imagine the samples of Darvison, and Vicodin and names I'd never heard of except for the foil packs like little slumbering astronauts packed in for a long flight to Mars. Her log of double entries, patients given fictional scripts while she tucked the samples into a hidden pocket in her purse, anecdotes of chatting up the detail men to keep the supply rolling. Hell, when they finally caught up with me, I was able to flush most of them down the toilet. I hadn't sold a one of them, she said. I think I was more addicted to the hoarding them than actually using them. I thought I'd never be able to accumulate enough. Doc Williams fired me, but he wouldn't call the sheriff. Everybody knew though. I reconsidered my own mother's exile in the wake of getting nabbed, surrendering me and putting me and, and, and being put on the brief, shameful run from neighbors. The unbroken addiction and slow fade, I looked in Mora's eyes for some trace of her. Where did you go from there? He steered me into inpatient treatment, she said. Had my license suspended, no prosecutor could prove that I was dealing. She eyeballed me, repeated herself. I never sold them. I nodded. One liar to another. Although Mora was clearly a person who knew things about the town. My husband left me. I lost my job. I'd only been trained as a nurse, she said. I had to work a series of odd jobs to keep myself solvent. Nursing assistant, cleaning up shit, the counter out at the quick mart, bartending, I'd count it as humiliating. I asked what I, uh, what I thought was the clincher. Why didn't you leave town? I didn't know anywhere but here. The nursing home saved my life, gave me a chance to work among patients again, helped me get my license reinstated. You don't feel any particular loyalty to them? She sighed. I've worked there two years and they didn't, don't pay that good. They got their money's worth out of me. I got my license renewed. I could hit the road, but I don't know if I'm up to reinventing myself elsewhere. My own deceptions started coming back to me out of her mouth. Your ex still live in town? Yes. She went silent, making it clear that was all she was telling me. Given all that, I reached across the desk and picked up a prescription pad. I showed her its cardboard backing. She watched as I turned it end over end, allowing its weight to clack against the desk. Why should I trust you now? I'm clean. Mora stared into me and winked. Besides, who do you know in town better than me? I know these people. Do you? She had me there. I liked her clarity. She'd revealed plenty of shabby corners to me, a stranger. But the addiction. I imagine my mother telling her own story to counselors and interviewers. How many unpolished corners had my mother revealed or invented of herself in the years between leaving me and now, and to how many strangers, each to the effect of leaving her hearers and maybe herself more deceived than she'd consciously cobbled to herself together as a set of fictions, which told less, the lies or the truth. Mora's eyes wouldn't tell me anymore, so I told her that I'd think about it. She invited me to call the nursing home administrator, her inpatient counselor, and the sheriff's county service officer as references. I took her information. After she left, I looked at the names and numbers of those who would recommend her. I picked up the phone and started to dial the sheriff's office to get their account of Morris' story, in particular the identity of her ex-husband, but I hung up. I wasn't sure that I wanted anyone at the sheriff's office to know my voice, and what right did I have to know her ex's name? I opted for the karmic possibilities of hiring some version of my mother. Perhaps the less we knew about one another in the end, the better. The novel itself is um, written in uh, 50 chapters, one for each state. And so it kind of follows the course of a, uh, you know, an, a, an un, undeclared civil war in a way of, of, of acts of violence. Um, some of these are detailed within the storytelling itself, and, uh, and some are kind of rumored or alluded to as, as things develop. Um, one section is uh, in uh, uh, the, the Montana chapter, um, and I'll read just a, a quick passage from that. The people's common law courts of the Montana Terry had made their res resurgence in the state. As the markets unwound themselves in the specious trade of third-hand energy derivatives and volatility funds, executives took the fifth in succession. The common law courts started going after corporate robbers because the federal courts couldn't or wouldn't. The West was ablaze with dedicated local deputies who were willing to serve papers and abduct these men one by one for the common law. Anyone who did business within or around Montana was liable to arrest. No state border was sacred. 
In the name of the common law courts of the people of Montana, I arrest you, the deputies would say to each one, dragging them from their beds in the middle of the night. In the name of what, they'd ask, as expensive dogs barked down the long, dark condo hallways. The common law movement kept these men hidden in a compound somewhere in the folds over or along the sovereign border of Canada. The state police were powerless. The FBI called it the most pervasive series of kidnappings in American history. While judges promised the men fair speedy trials while the West blew up and the wages of security contractors increased tenfold overnight. The bomb ripped through the home of a common law judge headquartered in Big Arm in the middle of the night. Sleeping on a couch behind a solid wall, he was thrown clear of the house into a bank of stinkweed. It took rescuers 20 minutes to find him when they reached the scene. They pieced the place back together to find the source of the blast. In surveillance footage shot from the security camera that the judge had himself installed on his garage, debris moved through the night. Unbroken, his toilet ended up on his neighbor's cleanly mowed lawn. The rumors and disinformation started within minutes. Primary among them was that the judge was a well-known, had a well-known meth lab stashed in his laundry room. Common law deputies suspected an attempt on his life. They began their own investigations. I read the story three times. I couldn't get that toy out of my head, flying through the night, hard and white and ass over end like America. One of the things that, that uh, develops in the story is that uh, uh, one of Rex's patients um, seems to have kind of an insight into the patterns of violence in the country. And uh, he's associated with a uh, militia group in, in Louisiana and, uh, and then starts to develop uh, these strange symptoms. And so uh, in Rex's mind, he is cooking up some sort of uh, homegrown plague uh, there. And so Rex kind of commits himself to uh, disclosing the patient's identity. However, he doesn't want to do it and, and kind of uh, reveal himself. So he, he, he goes looking for a payphone at a truck stop down along the highway uh, in Southern Minnesota. Um, and so I just want to read a, a quick passage from that uh, chapter as well. This is from Maryland. I need a straight story. Driving I-90 at 2 a.m., I'd resolve to make the call from elsewhere. Not reading the internet. I'd found a number of the FBI's field office in the Twin Cities on page two of the phone book. Make the call from Albert Lee or Austin at least, but not too close to Minneapolis, beyond the reach of a phone tap. Quick call to the local law yard shift approaching me on a payphone. How are we doing tonight, sir? Would you mind coming with me? A thick film of prairie insects collected on my windshield, biomass, bug bodies, flowered into stars across the glass. I thought about inviting Mora along for the ride, but didn't want to involve her in what were probably my own private self-deceptions about Skaggs, my patient, and his intimations of America's buzzing convulsive heart. Aloud, I practiced what I'd say on the phone. All windows down, I spoke into the air's black passing roar. I might have some information that would be helpful. Might? But how many tips had the FBI already received in the past 48 hours with the bombings? When I got back in the morning, I'd head straight for the pharmacy and get courses of Cipro for both Mora and me as a precaution. There'd be the now routine red tape of obtaining high potency antibiotics, plus maybe a bribe for Mora's friend, the pharmacist. He'd give me the fish eye when I'd name her on the script. But then I'd drop by her house early with some coffee and donuts, that and the Cipro, a romantic gesture, the makeup sex, the FBI would have apprehended Skaggs by mid-morning, the sample fetched up out of his lungs in a Fort Detrick lab by dusk. I have information that will be helpful to you in investigating. Perhaps apprehending? Apprehending whom? One of my ailing patients who'd rambled in confidence? Had he really made a threat now, just a broken confidence? And some information, the information that would save lives? Maybe not even information, a tip, a hunch, gambler's talk, a bet, bet number nine in the fifth race, and where did I come by this tip? An exam room hint wasn't exactly a slip up during interrogation. It had all the weight of pillow talk carried from some small town motel room. Maybe I should have more check my final draft before unwinding it for the FBI. Were the Bureau's other tips any more substantive? 
passed an army truck near I-35 as it rumbled along at a steady 50 miles an hour in the right lane, staring straight ahead behind the latched metal gate, the helmeted guardsmen inside looked bored out of their minds, probably just out on some beefed up workout, an exercise in the state's paranoia. If it was a real emergency, they'd be dropped in by helicopter, right? I passed the truck, but I steered the car too hard back into the right lane, swerving onto the shoulder and back. What the fuck was I thinking? I checked the rear view mirror for the unperturbed headlights of the truck, eyeballs prodding the dark and clearly focused beyond the likes of me. I could have driven off the road and through a field easily and those eyes wouldn't have blinked, cruising through the corn across flat land and awakening in mid-Iowa around dawn, no worse for the roadless detour. How far could I travel in America beyond surveillance, avoiding any semblance of road? Crossing open fields, I could veer back into Iowa, still only a half day's drive to home, make my confession, maybe even return to the dark of the, that nurse's office, huffing the antiseptics of childhood, a fugitive homecoming. I have information that might be helpful in the investigation of the, the bombings, the terrorist acts, the unstated battleground of the undeclared civil war, or that is the country's unfinished violent business as usual. What would they label this hunch on Skaggs? Maybe they already had a file on him. Could I connect as many dots for them over the phone as he had on my exam table? Maybe there was no narrative. My brain cultivated by Skaggs nonsense. A pin pulled from the grenade rolled my way and exploding backwards into some predetermined order as if Skaggs had fumbled my plastic brain and then tried to reassemble it from memory. Maybe just random acts of violence the calculated acts of random violence, random only to the uninitiated, the real violence crouched in their randomness, the highway unwound in moonless blackness. Thank you for your patriotism, sir. And what is your name? Me? Should I insist on anonymity or drop a dead man's secondhand name? In what Walmart parking lot should I meet the agents at dawn where they'd come swooping down in their windowless vans to take me to headquarters for a proper interrogation. They'd want to know when Skaggs first became a patient, as well as when I first became suspicious of his illness. They'd want to take my blood and sputum. If coerced, what should I sign? Did I have a lawyer's phone number in my wallet? Was it even my wallet? Whose pictures were in it? What if I started to speak in Russian to my captors? Was I in on the plot? How long had they been watching me, waiting for me to call? Did my old man ever use an alias to seduce a woman in a Montreal cocktail lounge? I passed a truck loaded with caged chickens just a few miles from Hormel's killing floors in Austin. For a second, I wondered whether they were at all connected to the soldiers I just passed, a load of infected birds headed out for the slaughterhouse, but, not, but for some bio lab well east of here maybe infected by some back prairie virus cooker, the soldiers in hot pursuit, the FBI already well onto the plot. I tried to count the chickens as I passed. The number of cages on the length of the truck times its width times the three chickens packed in each cage, my math drifted. I checked again for the truck in my rearview mirror, feathers and chicken shit scattering in the Minnesota night. I got tired and pulled off. At 3.30 a.m., I found what had to be the last payphone in Austin, a truck stop just off the interstate, a payphone by the, the back door, marked sh trucker showers. I dialed all but the last digit from the FBI's 1-800 tip line. A couple of my paper napkins over the phone to disguise my voice, my hand cupping the mouthpiece as my hands or my eyes drifted nervously across the parking lot for the random state cop. A couple of truckers joked at the diesel pumps. I couldn't go through with it. I hung up and went inside for coffee. I checked my pockets for money, nothing. I went back and searched the car for change, not much, less than a buck. I took stock of America inside the truck stop. What would the landscape look like after the plague? Who would wear all these funny caps or drink all these tall boys of Red Bull? What would happen to all the good natured? My country now become the scene of the crime. I thought about Mora washing her first dose of Cipro down with her morning coffee. What if the FBI didn't act on my tip? They figured Skag was about as contagious as a suitcase. Skag's talk about whether it was possible to commit a treasonous act that was patriotic. I'd carry a plague, he'd said. I went to the counter. Behind it, a blonde teenager who could have been the cousin of that girl who worked 
at the hotel's desk. I spilled my change onto the counter. Coffee, please. I didn't want to use a card. She picked through the nickels and dimes. It's almost enough for a small, she said, poking it into the leave a penny, take a penny dish. But get a medium. I'll spot you. I loaded the coffee with sugar, put a black plastic lid on it, and returned to the phone. I dialed the number, this time leaving the paper napkins in my pocket. I tested my opening words. The coffee had scratched up my voice. The click of a pickup, a beep as some digital recording device slipped into motion. The voice that answered was confident even in the middle of the night. Federal Bureau of Investigation, how can I help you? Behind the voice, a string of beeps that indicated that I was being recorded. I have information that might be helpful to you. I'm sorry, sir, I can't hear what you're saying. I pulled the napkins out of my pocket and wrapped them tightly around the mouthpiece. A semi loaded with diesel rumbled by. I said, I have information that might be helpful. I named Skaggs. I shouted his name into the phone as trucks rolled back out into the 4 a.m. America. Then I drove home like hell. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Karen. Um, I'm Ned Robertson. Uh, I'm going to read from uh, MPH, um, my last book of poems. Uh, MPH is a composite book. It was um, back in 1970, uh, Andy Welsh and Dick Vandal um, Dick was a painter, a uh, high school teacher. Andy was a PhD candidate at Pitt. And um, I had uh, just finished my undergraduate work at University of Pittsburgh. We hopped on two, two, two BMWs, two BMWs 500, and went cross country. Um, this is a year after um, Easy Rider. Um, so what I did was I, I, I wrote this book along the way. We spent a couple of months. I wrote this book all, along the way, came back and pieced it together and then lost it uh, for 40 years. I lost it. Um, but, um, I kept talking to the book and talking to the poems in my other work. Um, so it, even though I didn't have the book in front of me, I was writing to it, I was completing it. And a few years ago, when I was selling my house, um, I, a friend of mine, uh, Patricia Sazic, found the manuscript in the attic. I had no idea how it had traveled with me that much time. I uh, found it in the attic, handed it to me, and it took me a month to actually look at it. I was afraid of the manuscript. When I did look at it, I discovered that it was me, that, it, that I had been talking to myself this way all along. So a friend of mine, Peter O'Leary, said, put this together, put the, the conversation and the manuscript together. And that's what MPH is. Um, it doesn't move chronologically, it doesn't move uh, through the lost manuscript, the found manuscript, and it, it, it's all over the place. It talks, it talks to itself all through the, all through the book. So um, <laughs> uh, let me just start. One thing visible every day, anytime, 24-7, for three months, 8,000 miles, was MPH. On the speedometer, a small petty thing, a pin down of a larger limiting, a sighting, an ideograph, even more than a picture beyond word. Staging, milling around, not a narrative, not a word walked through 
neither a slide show of your time in other places, in the sense of a track, a record, a checkoff writ in a particular geographic like as box in a theater of states, not scenic, accurate, the people, the customs, the events, but a response to the sense of wandering, of rootlessness, of isolation in your own country, of a despair, the mortality of freedom, of the adventure, the new as territory, of quest, of myth, a campaign. But also a question, a getting down dirty to looking, a lesson been done, experience then, of what to do with what you bring back. On return, of return, forgetting, losing, finding, what has happened to both? The question of change, changing places, changing lives, fortunes, backside, time, the campaign of is, is there, a same physicality in the end, or as Fat says, one never knows, do one. As sure as shit, the outcome comes, out shit. You might as well piss on a Koran when no one knows what a Koran is, or any of those unknown locations. On a ledge of a Bergstrand, I had to go. I simply had to go from the end of the world. Beside two rivers, just made one. Beside the river here, the Mississippi, just now new from the Allegheny and Mahongahela, just become the Ohio, just before we hit the Ohio line, before we're out of town, just before the just then Ohio is the Mississippi, we pull up beside a city truck with a dump full of young black bloods, like in Mississippi. At the West End Bridge, leaving Pittsburgh, headed for Ohio, state line, which we actually never see, the first of those drawn lines, which we never actually see, we see that this is Mississippi, beside two rivers just made one, not even out of town. Another load of brothers sees two cycles and a brother loaded on the back, headed cross country. Five waves, some, where are you headed? jibes, nine black power hands, one peace sign, one you'll never make it, one pair of still leaving with me eyes. These, I promise us, I swear to these eyes, as the slaves flew, we will, we will, we will be free to do this. Because when we made the Middle Passage, didn't we walk the waters? Didn't we have the waters paved with the skulls of our grief for each other? Didn't we make it on ourselves? When we crawled under the Mason Dixon, didn't we jump the fence over Jordan? Didn't the river rebed behind us and turn blood because the bloods wouldn't tell? Didn't we make it to this one side on our other, on ourselves? Didn't we get put up when we went back down home? Didn't we hide in each other? No hotels that we stood uppity, a chance of getting shot. Didn't we walk on the shadows years later of Emmett children who did? Didn't, didn't it make your step higher than just to walk? Didn't the westward push, opening the country, turn middle passage, trying to shut us out, panic at the plow flat and hardness of our feet, having stood on each other. Didn't we open the rock like our hearts? Didn't it bleed too, to yield, too, to eat? Didn't it, didn't it, didn't it rain, didn't it rain?
the rider spreads out the map on the driver's back, like on a table out of the wind while moving. Some seeing through what is spread out on the head of both is foreseen like collision and corrected for. The idea, stillness of the map, moving necessary changes of mind when the sign passes. Or St. Christopher carrying the weight of his weight size, a giant and a child in that story, a black and a white at this crossing who both could be either and both, but also are the national figure for trouble, not on the dashboard. The rifle behind in the rifle rack, the road signs barely readable for bullet holes, the race drawn fires, permanent letting in of light, sneers through the map on the driver's back out of racist catechistic habit not a sign given is left readable. No idea where we are. This machine needs help. You can hypnotize chickens with a white line and a snake of a road straight can stand a bird named Detroit model still at 90 miles an hour, hit hard enough. The still in the instant replay of Newton pitching an apple at himself. Listen, you sustained a hole between your eyes for the truth of your bead on the apple. The fingering is red, whole apple, and the note it produces is thought of as distance, a mineral. And to get to this music, the bull's eye, the matador fingers, the same time as his aim and his wounds, you finger, plate after plate in the pie of horizon as rosary, the plum of vast spirals, lights in your thumb, the night you wake and the sky has moved. Road icon, a vacant black square, a sun, a, a windshield eye, shades, the glistening muzzle teeth of the tractor grill, the fuming mirage of asphalt breath, burning earth that lifts over, road monster, Mesoamerican in its mass iconography, or should be. A Tula stone, a temple summit, from a view that on ascent up those stairs appears to dawn rising over the termination in the sky of those steps, the horizon of the pyramid top. But instead here, the top of these hills, these mountains, have the wings of two exhaust clouds, have the eon thunder, as their 18 years, the mask of coming weather here, a truck rising over a hill. Who doubted the force of this collision with these spirits? That it could throw your centuries aside into your face, into its heart, loud spirit of the place, the nature of the gods. The, the motorcycle crossing. This is, I wrote this at the desk. <laughs> it must have been about 20 years after the ride. I wrote this at the desk, just suddenly remembering uh, in, um, at Rutgers. Sometimes it's all in how you get seated in the road of the morning. This morning, I was sitting at the desk, kicking out paper like miles. 
And like coming up over the top of a hill into sun or air or clear of the high road war, I laid her over right there. You don't think, you run over them. And snakes can rope up into your smoke, spokes and throw the bike. It takes nothing, a stone. So ain't nothing happening in the office and you lay it down, mean it all going down inside. Secretary step in, you sitting at the desk, unannounced, a silver veil of tear wearing down your face, a landscape singing quiet to yourself. Every little thing gonna be all right. No snake, no slick, no stone. I just laid it down. Late afternoon, summer, the long rhythm of soft running water and its silence. You could hear the wake of the collards parting the water. Long black lines, her fingers passing through those greens. When we were growing up, you know, those sisters at the sink in the kitchens, baptizing those greens, suddenly break down into tears, jump up singing, shout, don't worry, don't worry. Someday it'll be all right. Must be in my blood. Blood, my blood has had to lie in, absorbing the lives we were losing, bathing in screams. The tide rhythm blood and filth took on, rocking in that deluge, those ships cut to our God for drink must be in my blood. Given our own blood to drink, blood of the hold, Bloods of the fields, drying in those furrows through our feet, up through any root blossoming at the tip of our touch, into the cloud bowl of cotton, held it an instant, then sacked the bitterness of this fruit, clothing a nation. Leaving for work this morning in the new blood, a new press, the rungs of the upward ladder, treacherous as the deepened sea. A kid rolls down the window the rest of the way down and spits at us. What's the physics for I am past spat at? Past, but yet every time I get the cold stray drop of somebody's windshield wash spray, the past returns. You think it never reaches you, yet the past doesn't have to. You are reached. What's the physics for already there in the future? The fine arts teacher. Peanut butter and jelly faces side down against the window as they pass, get yelled at to sit down in the back. In the back seat now, look, guys on motorcycles with sleeping bags and clothes. I bet even buoy knives probably gone to the other side of the country, mountains and deserts and all. Wow. Sit down back there. I said, stop staring at those hobos. Hippies, mom, they're cool. They're useless bums and a nigger. Now sit. Dick has been a teacher for years. He knows kids. Each fall, new scribbles in the chapters of affiliation to what will be life for them. He sees better and further than they do. From back seat, yelled at, to front seat driver. All we really are out here for is to see. Dick, who sees a little hand rise over the lip of the rear seat, fingers a V, a peace sign. Dick throws both hands off the handlebars, open arm, returns a two-hand peace sign with no hands on the bike. A brief few se seconds, we all are bug-eyed. Then the head disappears. Sit down, I said. I'm not going to tell you again. Peace, mom. Peace.
at the far edge of circling the country, facing suddenly the other ocean, the boundless edge of what I had wanted to know, I stepped into my answers. Shallow ocean. The tightening curl of the corners of outdated old paperbacks, breakers, a crumbled surf of tiny dry triangles around my ankles, sinking into my stand taken, that the horizon written by the sign of my compass is, that this is, is not, a not, a not enough, a point to turn around on, is like a skin that falls short of edge as a rug that covers a no longer natural spot, a no longer natural existence to live on from, the map of my person come to the end of, but not done, that the country cross was what I could imagine, that this little spit of answer is the shadow, not the ocean which casts it, that I step next into to be dreamed of question, but not of seeking. It is as if simplified for the seeking come to its end at this, this body. Thank you. Thank you both um, for those incredible readings. Um, it's Q&A time. So if you do have questions uh, for Garen or Ed, please feel free to submit them using the Q&A. We do have some questions to start. I have some questions uh, if we're able to get to them. Um, our first question from Lindsay. Um, uh, Lindsay asks, I'd like to ask Garen about the 50 chapters and how the appearance of each state works in the book. Are some places given more airtime, some less? And how do those decisions get made? Uh, and how does each state look when it appears? Knowing Garen's propensity for travel, how did he choose what to show or focus about each state? Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, the, the, the novel starts in the South. Um, it, it starts in Georgia with the, uh, uh, the, the bombing of a newspaper office. And then, um, and then moves to South Carolina where a homemade mortar uh, fires on Fort Sumter again. So it's, uh, it starts in the, in, in, you know, in the same kind of uh, pattern as the, as the war did. Um, the 50 chapters is, yeah, part of it's just the practical kind of nature of, the, of, of writing the book because it was written in, you know, short bursts of, of activity over summers a lot, a lot of it was written that way. So. Uh, it just became a practical way of, of, of working through it. And then the idea of um, just kind of exploring the, the states and, 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 and uh, you know, our own kind of emerging kind of disintegration uh, during the, the time of writing the book over the last six, seven years um, kind of took hold in a way as well. Um, there, the, and then the, as far as the final ordering of the book went, um, it ends on I-35 driving south. Um, from Minnesota, uh, where he takes up in a small town and then, and then ends up going south uh, when, he, when he's made, finally, and he has to leave. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the final shape of it was I just kind of pasted all the, the chapters on the wall and kind of tried to figure out a way of, of, of making some kind of coherent narrative out of them in the end. So that was the final shaping. Uh, there's a, another follow-up question from a viewer, Christopher, who asks uh, if, if the chapters serve mostly metaphorically or do they, you've you read them on some of the chapters, you know, obviously take place in the States that they that they that take their name from, but uh, Christopher asks, does each chapter focus on events happening in those States? Yeah, the, the uh, there's a there's an act of violence that occurs in each of them. Some of them, like I say, are narrated and some of them are just kind of rumored or you know, they're, they're the background of, of what's happening, um, you know, uh, as he's in the office, the radio's playing and the, the you know, the latest atrocity is, you know, uh, comes over the radio. Um, and, and, and so uh, the, the, I, I tried, I, I mean, I've tried to kind of uh, weave them into a really kind of hard practical geography in a way as well um, to, to kind of rethink the, uh, the, the, the present kind of, uh, uh, the present kind of divisions that are that we find. Um, so they, they I tried they've tried to work beyond metaphor in, in a lot of ways to uh, to to kind of reset the map in a way. 
Thank you. Um, I think it's really wonderful to have you both read from what are essentially, you know, a road poems and, and a road novel. Um, in my reading experience as, uh, as a student and as a bookseller, um, it seems pretty much since even before the national system of interstate and defense highways, as they were called, were finished, that people were writing about uh, the road and that the sort of interstate travel and, and sort of road stories in America are sort of a, a feature of, of our letters. Um, and it's really fascinating to see the parallels uh, and between MPH and, and Garen Rex insofar as um, those narratives are a way to explore essentially how those roads sort of create these literal and figurative schisms in, in the country um, and also sort of reinforce something uniquely alienating about American experience. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, if you both be willing to speak to what draws you to I don't want to say it's like a genre because it's not, but what draws you to uh, that kind of narrative, whether it's in through the work of poetry um, or through a novel that I suppose in many ways resembles a collection insofar as it has, it's made up of these kinds of pieces. Um, maybe just talking a bit about, you know, how, what kind of ideas seem to be we writers seem to be able to work through um in the sort of the road narrative i'm sorry if that question makes no, no sense but i'm, I'm trying to th think through the really interesting uh ways that your works talk to each other and, and you're talking about how you were talking to this book through your writing so so i'm curious to hear how you you know this that project hadn't left you obviously the manuscript hadn't left you yeah um when when uh, Andy was was finishing his dissertation, and uh, he was um, uh, 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 what now is called ethnopoetics, uh, um, uh, technicians of the sacred, uh, altering uh, you know that kind of stuff that was being published, and uh, the stuff Gary Snyder was doing. I was reading that um, when we took off, and mm -hmm. Andy. Um, just talking to Andy, uh, I was getting an education um, by just talking to him, uh, an education about um, Native American uh, uh, literature, uh, literature in North Africa uh, and um, Egypt. Um, so w when I left, um, I had no idea that it was going that I was going to be working on a road poem. I was thinking I was just going to be taking notes and and picking up um, things, conversations, and things along the road. But I began to see um, I, I, I began to see some of those things in a different light, like like the the rifles on the back of the you know on gun racks, mm -hmm. the signs that are. Um, just blown away um and that still continued i think just last week the the baseball uh, folks had to replace the uh, jackie robinson um memorial because people had just blasted it to pieces um uh and i began to see that stuff uh, so the idea of ancient chants mm -hmm. And modern and ancient war dances and modern warfare, civil warfare, personal warfare, it was all mixed in, became very real. So um, studying chants, I began to hear chants. Mm -hmm. And so my study of something like Native American um, work, like um, war dances, um, it led me to looking for those kinds of patterns within black literature and within the life that I was living, what I was hearing around me. So um, I began to, you know, make a note of that kind of stuff. So the road actually was like a long, long library, hmm. a 
a long introduction um, from the past to the present, or just a ride from the past to the present. Um, and it just kept going. When I lost the, when I lost my notes, I didn't lose what was in my head. I didn't lose what was happening. So it, it just continued. And so a lot of my writing you know, has those kinds of things, finding the chance in the life that I live, finding the war songs in the blues, you know, that kind of thing. And noticing how, like I say, it's, it, 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 it didn't go anywhere. It's all still here. It's all <laughs> still here. Past didn't go away. Can I, if I can follow up on that quickly, Ed, did, did you have a, a sonic experience in reopening the poem and reopening the notes when you, when the box was found? Did I have a what kind? Uh, like a sonic experience? Did you hear things? Oh, I oh that oh I know what you're saying. I do know what you're saying. That never stopped actually. I never stopped hearing the ride. Mm -hmm. I would be sitting that poem about the motorcycle mm -hmm. motorcycle crossing. That was in I think about 1980, 83. I was sitting at my desk uh, uh, at Rutgers doing paperwork. And for some reason or other, um, I just heard the cycle. And I, I've done that before. You're just sitting there and, and it just feels like you hear the cycle, <laughs> you know. Um, or you feel that movement. It doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. Um, it, it, because it's a kind of um, trigger for a kind of knowledge, you know. And um, it's, it's, it's like you hear the sound, something's coming. <laughs> I'm thinking something, you know. Um, or you see that certain kind of vista. Okay, I'm going to see something in two minutes. Something's going to flash, you know, that kind of thing. So when you say, was there a sonic experience when I got the manuscript? No, it was just fear. <laughs> It's like, oh God, I'm I'm going to get I'm have to get back on this thing again, mm. you know, back on the cycle again. Um, but these those things never stop. They 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 they, they just keep coming. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's I. Uh, there's something about yeah the, this idea of the road as an education is really uh, fascinating. When I was uh, an an MFA student, my my manuscripts uh, of poems was was uh, each poem was the name of a u.s interstate um and i had been driving um uh, hundreds of hours for whatever reason and there was something uniquely i mean you get like literally velocitized on the road and it's it's very hypnotic but in the same way uh obviously different for me and, and my experience as a young person in the, in the uh, you know, driving in the time I was driving in, but it, it, it there's something like apocalyptic about it too. Uh, and, and, and Garen, I wonder for you, like what the connections there are for, for like a road novel. And it just makes sense to have, you know, travel through the United States be associated with this kind of, feeling like you're seeing these visions of collapse and says the sort of history that sort of has never left. Um, I always thought too about the interstates as like perhaps occultic because, <laughs> because they were a defense project. Um, so you feel like you're participating in this very st stark, st striking uh, American project. Um, so I just, I'm curious for you, like what the connections are between you know, and, and not saying you're, were you consciously writing a road novel as a way to explore these themes of social disintegration um, or this is just sort of organically happened that way? Sorry, again, I feel like I'm asking another rambling yeah. question. No, there's like, there's a, there's this great moment on uh, I-57, the road that take into the city from, from here that uh, it, uh, as you go north on it, and it dumps into the Dan Ryan Express where it just says I-57 ends. So it's like this apocalyptic <laughs> moment. Of like, is it, but, but, the, but like in Chicago, right, the, the, the real kind of like the ways in which those roads have been cut into the, right. uh, cut into the city, 
cut into neighborhoods, cut into the experience of you know people you know, of residents and 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 associations and, and and friendships and all the ways in which the, those have been cut into parishes um, that, that that just seems that um, uh, it, it, I mean it's the it's a profound change in the way that we you know experience the geography of the city. The other one is that when you leave Chicago on the Dan Ryan, it's there's this great moment where you get onto I-57 and it does, the sign is for Memphis. And it's always kind of slightly heartening to me. It's like, oh, I'm going to Memphis, you know. But then, but but no, not in the end. But um, and I've always kind of like like lived on that 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 um that perch of roads in a way that my first book was called Blue Mound to 161, which right. is named for uh, a road that ran south of the town I grew up in, Flora, Illinois, uh, and runs runs south. And it, there's just a really profound change, I think, in the geography there. Where you feel like you've crossed um, from prairie into kind of more rolling uh, country, it feels like you're crossing from from north to south in some ways, um, and you hit this road called Highway 161, which is an old bootleggers road um, where the Shelton gang from around Fairfield, Illinois, used to run booze to St. Louis and the, the Metro East area a lot, um, and so roads always. I'm I'm just always kind of curious of who's traveled them, you know, and I always yeah. want to find, find those, those spaces as well. And there's a, a definitely kind of an American apocalyptic feel to that. There was one point it was in Utah. Um, they were putting through um, the new interstate and uh, we were following old maps. And so we were on mm. the road that was still used. Mm. Uh, and we came to a town and the town was completely deserted. It's a modern town. Um, um, there were just no people there. Um, and it was like um, a twilight zone moment. Um, there, and, and obviously people lived there, but you didn't see anybody. And, and you know, so, you know, we kind of freaked out. Finally, what we found out was that the interstate was being built a mile away. And so this town um, was completely deserted. Everybody was working on the interstate. And the town was no longer connected to the world. Right. <laughs> was what was was what was going to happen. What we were right. seeing well, was what was going to happen to the town. Um, that twilight moment that we were experiencing, those people are going to have to come back from work once that interstate gets productive and they're going to have to live in that twilight zone that we pulled into we could leave they can't that was kind of frightening that's incredible yeah um there's one more question here um uh bruce wants to know uh garen if if uh, more about the publication of your forthcoming book of of poetry if and if it's called uh, prairie yeah, I'm trying to trying to finish it. It's it's a, um, a colleague I teach with at, at IU Northwest, um, Jerry Hall, has kind of been doing this historical project on ditches, <laughs> uh, and ditches cut into Northwest Indiana and the, the you know kind of profound influence of of uh, on the ecology, you know, of the wetlands um, just from this you know uh, 130 years of ditch cutting. Um, through there in the rechanneling of the Kaskaskia and all that stuff. So it's kind of kind of propelled me into thinking about water and the substance of water and how water changes. Um, and so it, it kind of threw me backwards into like kind of thinking back through experience of water in my life and rivers crossed and um, and 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 the different kind of substances that those rivers you know have become. Um, and so that's that's where that's gone. Thank you. Um, we're, we're reaching the top of the hour. Boy, I, I feel like I could ask you both. <laughs> I want to ask you both a dozen more questions uh, about your work, about the way your work speaks to each other. Um, um, but I also don't want to keep you <laughs> from your other affairs and uh, dinner and everything else. Um, so uh, we'll have to do this again, hopefully at the bookstore. But uh, Garen Cycle, Ed Roberson, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
we'd love to have you in the store and, and all of our viewers uh, thank you so much for joining us thanks we look all. forward to have you in you at the next event take care everyone thank you ed thank you thank Please. you take care all